Welcome to this Roll for Crit review. Today, we're going to be taking a walk through the Tang Garden. In this game, it is the Tang Dynasty in China, and you have been tasked by the Emperor to build him a new garden for him and his lover. Now, you will have to make sure this garden is beautiful by building out the garden itself, adding decorations, inviting some very important people to check out the place, and probably keep the Emperor and the Empress and lover away from each other. Now, before we actually dive into the game, we're gonna let you know we're running a contest for this game where you can win a free copy. We'll have a link down below to how to sign up. So after you watch this game review, and if you're impressed, go check out that contest and enter to see if you win. You don't wanna miss out on that. Here's how the game works. On your turn, you're going to have two major options. You can either build up the garden or decorate the garden. To build it, you will take one of the tiles from one of the four piles in the corners, as long as there is a face up tile showing there, sometimes there won't be, you can take one of those and place it somewhere onto the main board, the garden that you're all building together. You're going to have to match each side of this that is going to be adjacent to another tile by its terrain type. So it could be rock, greenery, or water, or the footpath. You will be rewarded for matching up those terrain types or by having bordering footpaths. Uh, the footpaths will get you coins, and coins are your victory points. That's how you're going to eventually attempt to win the game by having the most of those. Matching terrain types or enclosing terrain types, meaning that you have a fully enclosed section of them where you are unable to build off any further with different tiles, is also helpful to you as it will allow you to advance your personal tracks for each of those terrain types on your own board. We'll get to exactly what effect that has on the game later on. You'll also notice that there are tokens on the board that are called landscape tokens. If you place a tile in a spot where one of those tokens is, you take that token for yourself, it's now in your personal possession, and you get to place a landscape tile from the side of the board. So it could be a large or a small one, depends on the token you took, you'll have to match the symbols, uh, but there will always be two for you to choose from. You will take the one that you want and place it into any of the available slots on the outside edges of the board. This is going to be important for scoring later on, uh, and also it looks very pretty to look at. If there aren't any tiles that you can or would like to place to build up the garden, then instead you can decorate. To do so, you will draw two cards from the decoration pile, plus an extra card for every pile that is not showing a face-up tile on the board. Now, these are going to represent tokens or other types of pieces they'll be placing onto the board. It could be a pavilion, could be something simple like birds or fish, uh, little things that are going to decorate and make the garden look nicer, and more importantly, they're going to get you points potentially at the end of the game. Some of them require you to have certain sets. Uh, some of them require you to have multiples, for instance, trees. If you have multiple sets of different types of trees, those are going to be worth more points. Or in the case of pavilions, if you have more pavilions than any other player, you're going to get a bonus amount of points for that as well. So those are your two major actions you'll be taking each turn, but all the while, again, those things will be making you look back at your personal player board, at your personal tracks, and seeing how those affect your gameplay as well. That personal player board is going to be the main way you're going to interact with the character cards, which are the people who are, will be visiting the garden. If you look at this board here, there are three colors matching to the elements we mentioned earlier, the rock, the water, and greenery. And at the top, there are symbols. Every time all three make it to or pass one of the symbols that looks like a person, that means you may influence a character. To do so, you can take one of the two characters showing in the available pool or take one from the top of the deck. You will add them and their character to your selection of characters. You will then choose one character you have who you haven't placed on the board already to add to the board. So in this case, we can add, for example, the sword dancer onto any of the spots designed for people that actually include bridges and the pavilions. That's one of the reasons why you want to build them so they can be occupied. Each character has two separate abilities. The top one is an ability that you can use throughout the game while you're playing while they're off the board. So right now, only the officer's ability can be triggered. There'll be things like gaining coins every time you move up on the blue track or gaining rewards for placing specific tiles or landscapes. It's something to keep an eye out for. However, their big thing is their end game bonuses, which only trigger if they're on the board. For example, the sword dancer we just placed wants to see a lot of water landscapes at the end of the game. 
the direction they look at as well as the placement will judge whether they see it or not. So in this case, if she's looking to the left here, she can see right now three different landscapes that have the waterfall terrain symbol on it. Some of them will look at tiles. For example, the poet wants to look at water tiles in front of her. Now this can become quite the challenge, especially with other people trying to fulfill their own goals. So each player has their, these four actions, these lantern actions they can take in addition. Now they have different abilities like moving a character and rotating them in case there's a better view somewhere else. There's looking for a specific character or landscape view. Really, we're looking for that one last thing. There's also taking multiple decorations in one decoration action or multiple garden tiles in one garden tile action. So these are really strong and useful. Once you use them, they flip over and they become exhausted. But if you have enough landscape tokens, you can trade those in to refresh lanterns to do them all over again. Once there are only three landscape tiles available, or if one of these piles runs out, then you're gonna make sure everyone has an equal number of turns and you're gonna end the game and see who has the most money or the highest score. Yeah, so it is a tile placement game, uh, very, very purely, I would say, uh, with maybe some kind of slight elements of set collection here and there, mostly in the decorations and uh, how you're choosing to gather those. And everyone is working together in a sense, you're all building off of one garden, so it is a shared common area between all players, but of course it's still competitive, so the things that you're putting into play could help or hurt someone else, and that's where a lot of the thought comes into it when you're trying to decide how to place a tile. It's not just about what's going to help me. It's also about, well, who's after me? And if you're, especially if you're playing in a three or four player game, you have to think about what everything you're gonna do is going to do to the board state overall. And if you, you know, you wanna try not to, it almost becomes a thing of like the dots and boxes game, <laughs> you know, where you don't wanna set it up so that another player can enclose an area that you put into play for them, uh, or, oh, you leave a great spot and a tile happens to come out that is just perfect, that fits right in there and gets them a bunch of points. So you have to decide when is the best time to put those things out there. And that's why some of the things like the lantern action that allows you to play two tiles in one turn can be really strong. Uh, so yeah, that that's a big part of it is uh, reading other players and learning to sort of work together, but not work together too well. I actually want to focus on the thing you mentioned earlier of if a tile comes out. Now there is some randomness with the piles, but what's interesting is a lot of the actions usually are something good for you, but will help the next player. For example, the decorations. You get to draw more from the deck if more of these piles are face down. So sometimes you're like, I could take this tile, but I'm making it so you can draw more decorations. That said, however, all the tiles get to reset and become face up after you do decorations, meaning you're giving the next player full access to all four piles. So you're gonna have to be very careful about, is this the time I want decorations? Cause I'm giving, I'm setting them up to get whatever they want. And of course there are some tiles like this. This is wild on all sides, so they can fit this anywhere. And that could be devastating, closing off a bunch of areas and getting them a, a big reward. Yeah, when you see some of those tiles that are clearly the the cream of the crop tiles or some tiles that have already enclosed spaces like a lake or a pond so it automatically uh, will advance your track up no matter where you put it well assuming it's a place you're allowed to put it legally uh, those are really great and that's always like oh you know when that comes out they're probably not going to stick around for too long people are going to want to go after those uh, and then the characters them as well uh, you know you start with the character to begin with so you have a little bit of an idea of maybe you're going to go in the direction of oh I have a character that likes greenery, so that's kind of going to be my thing. But uh, someone else might also have a bunch of greenery that they're putting into play for one reason or another. And if you know the characters really well and you know what's coming up in that deck, you can even try to plan ahead and say, oh, I know that I haven't seen the one that particularly likes uh, villages, seeing villages off in the landscape. But I could use my tile at some point to dig for that. So maybe I'll set up just in case that happens and hope no one else goes for that first. Uh, so there's there's a lot of pre-planning that you can do once you are familiarized with the stuff that's all, all the different characters and tiles and things that are in the game. There are a lot of those things. Uh, not so many. I don't think it's overwhelming, but 
uh, certainly I think where it becomes a little tricky is there's a lot of iconography on all the different tiles. And definitely there's a little bit of gr a growing pains, a learning curve to remembering exactly which symbols are good for which characters. And that's something where if somebody had played the game more and they were more experienced, they could definitely uh, roll over other players by having that knowledge in their heads. The back of the rule book does have a sheet that pretty much explains what each character does for both their actions. However, it's on the rule book. It's not what I would call a reference sheet because there aren't multiple copies for everyone to have their own. So it can be a little annoying at times when everyone each turn is just like, can I see that sheet again? It's just enough that I feel like they probably should have included that in this. Now, mm -hmm. I do want to mention one of the big appeals of this game is your building garden look pretty. They made it so you're going to make the game pretty. These pavilions are very 3D with these roofs on top when you actually you can't see from the overhead, but the way the landscapes will end up is they actually sort of match next to each other. So if you sort of look on the side, you'll see a pretty, pretty view. And yeah, it is. It is really nice. They did a great job with the components, I think. I do want to say we touched on sort of the complexity of this game. And if you're still having struggling trying to figure out exactly what the game flow is like, uh, we mentioned we talked about Carcassonne when we were playing it. That's like a very basic tile laying game that I think most people have experience with. And this is this is like Carcassonne with a lot more depth to it, I think not including all the expansions for Carcassonne, at least, just the base scheme. Uh, but in spite of some of that complexity and trying to remember which characters do what and what all the iconography is, at a certain point, I do think the game is pretty intuitive. And most of your turns will go, I mean, it's, and it depends on how many players you have and what kind of player you are. There's always going to be times where you get some analysis paralysis, you're trying to figure out the best play. But I found that a lot of times it seemed pretty intuitive to say, you'll start to look at the board and see, oh, I know this piece will fit with that. I know that I need uh, this type of terrain for the thing that I'm going for over here. And you're really just either building a tile or placing, taking a card to place something on it. And there's a lot of intricacies within that, but I think on a surface level, it's fairly easy to get into once you get past that hurdle. I, I mean, Carcassonne definitely is a similar idea with the tile laying pattern. Though I will say, for better or worse, I know there's sometimes when I've played Carcassonne and there's like, is this a full farm area? Is it separated? I don't think that's as bad here. There is some issues with tiles you'll come across, but it's definitely, at least for me, didn't become uh, a little as annoying because there's a bit more of an area region scoring the way in Carcassonne works. If you like Carcassonne, definitely check this out because it's got that similar vibe, especially for setting up tiles and like, I'm going to set this up so it shouldn't be beneficial for you, or maybe for me, or maybe you see a good setup like that. At least for me, this feels a, a lot more rewarding when you find that tile that fits right. It feels less about randomness because you can dig through things if you want. You can place two to get that one, two hit combo going. It takes a, at least a bit of the tile randomness away to give you more of the strategy to try to outmaneuver your opponents. Crits and misses for Tang Garden. Crits. There's a fun back and forth dynamic between players as you place tiles and build decorations that may or may not affect one another on your shared board. Many actions will often benefit other players, whether it's revealing more tiles or opening up new areas to build. So it's an interesting game of cat and mouse in order to decide, can you make the most optimal play without giving too much away to your opponents? You'll be scoring points via coins as the game goes on, but due to the nature of how tiles and decorations are placed, there are end game scores as well, and you'll never be quite sure who's in the lead at any given time. There may be ways to see if someone's maybe a little bit ahead by having more pavilions or other kinds of decorations, but at the end of the game, you may be surprised who comes out on top. Fittingly for the game's theme, its tiles and miniatures are very aesthetically pleasing, and by the end of it, you will feel like you have created your very own beautiful garden to enjoy. I won't lie, it's a little bit of a pain to pack up back in the box, but it's not worth taking away the beautiful scenery you'll have at the end of each game. Misses. There is enough iconography and different interactions that may lead to a little bit of analysis paralysis until you've got a couple games under your belt. This is also exacerbated by the fact that there really isn't an official reference sheet for you to use included in the core box set. There will be some turns early on where you may find yourself squinting at some tiles to make sure you can tell exactly where they line up or don't, and struggling to remember what each character does. 
Now, Tank Gardens does have a solo mode, which I did try a few games of. The way that works is you are building in a smaller map area shown on the, not on the board, but in the book, rule book. And your goal is each turn you can build one of the garden tiles, but there's a decoration by two that must also be built. So if you can fill up everything, you win. If you are unable to build something because you can't fit the decoration or fit a tile at all, you lose. You don't even get to look at how well you did. I lost the games I played. I came very close in my last one. It really is, at first I thought it was about randomness, but it's actually just making sure you have spaces to build those kinds of decorations. You really gotta make sure you don't close yourself off, which actually became a really interesting puzzle. Yeah, we recently reviewed Castles of Burgundy, which sort of has some similarities, also about tile placement and fitting tiles. And I feel like that solo game had a similar thing as to what this sounds like, which is it's a, it's a tough puzzle, and it, uh, you know, it keeps things tight, and so you you may not make it at the end. But I think that's appropriate for a solo game. I think that's what you want for this type of experience, so that you can keep replaying it, and that when you do get that win, it feels really good to have. Yeah, it's some of the times there's a little bit of randomness, like obviously with anything. But for the most part, once it starts to click with you, you're like, okay, oh, I do want to build that. It might not seem the optimal thing, but it's giving me a whole extra space for later. And there are special unique uh, lantern tokens for you to use for the solo mode. So they'll make more sense like discarding all the different terrains if there isn't one that, any that you can fit and like, you know, different actions that make more sense for the solo mode, which is nice that they have, this is meant for solo. Yeah, uh, overall, I was pretty impressed by Tang Garden. I, I There's not much that I think it really does poorly. I mean, we, we you know, our, our miss was about the iconography and all that, but... Uh, once you get into it, and if you do happen to find a reference sheet online, which they do exist, that can help you out a little bit, or you just familiarize mm -hmm. yourself more with the game, uh, it, it, it plays pretty smoothly, I think, considering how much there is sometimes to think about. And I think it's a really good medium, it, it feels like a medium weight game, but I don't think it's too tight. It's like just enough strategy that... There's stuff for you to chew on. There's stuff for you to think about. And I think hardcore gamers can really get into it. But it still has this relaxing kind of zen vibe like Carcassonne sort of does where you can just hang out and enjoy yourself making this fun little garden together. Uh, I really liked it. I had a good time. There are also plenty of expanses already because this was a Kickstarter at first. It's now being sold through uh, Lucky Duck Games. So you can check that out to add uh, some variety, to add like some more characters and... I know some more decorations as well, you know, pick up what you're looking to get with it. Yeah, well, if you missed out on that Kickstarter, we are giving you the opportunity to win a copy of Tang Garden. If you're watching this uh, during the time period which it's originally airing, then check the description. We'll put a link on the screen as well. You can enter a contest. It is through Gleam, so there are multiple ways for you to enter, and you get multiple entries, and we will randomly choose one lucky person to send out a brand new sealed copy of Tang Garden, a game that I genuinely do recommend. I do think if you are into tile placement uh, games of any kind, and I, you know, you're not feeling inundated with them, uh, this is one that has some interesting new ideas in it, and it looks very pretty. I can think it uh, safe to say that we both agree. If you do play a bunch of Carcassonne, this is a good upgrade for the that kind of game style. Yeah, I would say I would agree with that. Uh, but let us know what you think. Maybe you found things not to like about it that we didn't. Uh, maybe you have particular strategies you enjoy. Anything that you want to say about Tang Garden, we want to hear it in that comment section down below. So please leave that there for us. Until then, I'm Will. I'm Jonathan. And this has been a Roll for Crit review. Never miss out by liking and subscribing. And you can also check out more on our Patreon. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So follow us there.